Good. Good. JS, take one. Mark. So first, who are you? What do you do? Who am I? That's a very good question. I've been asking myself that ever since I was little. I'm still working on that. My name for the moment is Julian Schnabel. And I'm a painter. I've directed some movies, written a few movies. And uh, made some sculptures. What else did I do? Something like that. Made quite, made quite a few paintings. I think I made 3,000 paintings and six films. So you and Jonas both were these kind of are these Renaissance men do a lot of different things. Do you, I mean, do you feel a, a, like a resistance to categorization? No, no. I mean, I could have just said that I was a painter, but then I would have been being a little coy if I did that. And, but I don't really, really feel like I need, would need to say that I was a multidisciplinary artist in order to, I don't think that would necessarily explain anything. I mean, uh, I don't know who said this, but uh, reason is the opposite of truth. So if I start explaining what I'm doing, it's already not the thing that I do. But um, obviously, uh, you know, I make art, and, and that's what Jonas did, and uh, turned all sorts of things into art that one might not think uh, was. When did you first meet Jonas? I don't more than 30 years ago. Uh, that doesn't seem like so long anymore. But, um, let's see, it's the 25th year of the film Basquiat right now. And when I was making, and I was, there's a role, well, David Bowie plays Andy Warhol in the film and Jonas made a film, The Life of Andy Warhol. And he gave me some footage where I was blending David Bowie and, I mean, they were, David and Andy were doppelgangers in a sense. Uh, and so, and he had film of, um, what was her name? Uh, uh, Jackie Kennedy's sister, Lee. Lee. I knew her quite well, but I'm a little like that these days. Uh, yes, Lee's kids are playing uh, in the grass at Yosin, at the house there. They're having a sh shaving cream fight, and Andy's filming, and there's a couple other moments. There's also a moment where... Uh, uh, Caroline Kennedy is water skiing on Lake Montauk and the sound of the microphone is very uh, disruptive and agitated and it was perfect for the scene where Jean-Michel is where Jean-Michel is looking uh, at the TV and he's seeing all of these things that happened between Andy and him and uh, and there's a moment after he finds out that Andy had died, where you hear this um, abrupt, um, erratic sound, and it was perfect. And Jonas just gave me the footage. I mean, he was extremely generous and loving. And uh, it's funny because I, I've been working on this script with a writer named Daniel Kelman, who wrote a book called Till. He also wrote a book called Measuring the World. He's born in Germany, but he lived in Austria. And Till Ulgenspiel Ugen, was a, a jester during the Thirty Years' War. But there was something about this character where I guess he sort of um, died when he was quite young, when he was a child, but he didn't die. But he went through that in a way to where he got through, went through something where he basically wasn't scared of anything. 
and he seemed to walk between the raindrops. And after going through something that's very traumatic and difficult, which I think Jonas did, uh, there was a sense of freedom and he saw um, opportunities in the most simple things. I mean, if you look at some of the films, uh, obviously you have been in, but he could be dancing with a broom. He could be opening or a ladder or opening and closing drawers and making that into something that's dramatic or something that's charming. And... Yeah, I miss him. He was... What's amazing to me is that when he died, you know, at the Oscars they show people that are filmmakers, actors, people that have been involved, and no mention of Jonas Mikas, because it's a whole different world. But his love of other people's work and his generosity to take care of all of this stuff Uh, was a real mission, and um, but what a joyful, beautiful. Uh, I, you, you have to say something like that. It might sound like a cliche, but uh, it's not. And he, uh, it's funny. I'm just thinking about. I mean, and so many people love this guy. He was lovable. Anyway, when I made um, At Eternity's Gate, a film I made about Vincent van Gogh with, with Willem Dafoe playing Vincent, Jonas came to see it, and there were about 10 people, 12 people. People had opinions. And Jonas sat there. I mean, this is not long before he died. Maybe it was a, a year. Before. And he was sitting there, and he just said, I wouldn't change a frame. And uh, he got it. I didn't change a frame. <laughs> Somebody once said to me at one of these film festivals, if you were going to make a commercial film out of this, what would you do? And I said, yeah, I wouldn't change a fucking thing. When you first came to New York, did you see him like running around? I had a sense he was always everywhere all the time. Well, you know, uh, when young people come to New York, they don't, have this, I think he was very active with people that were a bit older than me. And, uh, but, you know, I started to go to Max's Kansas City uh, 1973, in the summer of 73. I knew, or knew, I met a lot of different people that, uh, maybe I might have been the youngest person in Max's Kansas City, in a sense, because if I think of... Um, people that are from my generation, they, they definitely weren't there. For some reason, I was comfortable in that peculiar place. And I had a friend named Bob Williamson, who I used to hang around with. There. He, his, he was Lauren Hutton's boyfriend. He was much older than me. Anyway, but there I met Robert Smithson and Richard Serra and Will, Bill de Kooning. Um, Andy was around. But I mean, these were not, these were people that I saw from afar. I mean, on occasion, I mean, I was actually talking to Robert Smithson or Richard Serra, but, or Bryce Martin, but, but I didn't uh, really know Andy at that time. But I was a witness and participant to all sorts of crazy stuff there. And obviously, Jonas would come in and out, but he, he, he also was in another kind of, uh, well, I think he was in an underground film world, and I think it was a bit different. But there was a big mix of everybody over at Max's. Did he have, when you did see him, would he have a camera? Like, was that a thing about him that you noticed? He wanted to record everything. Uh, but I guess I got to know him. That, um, now, we're, we're talking 1974. We're, that's almost 50 years ago. <laughs> I know I don't look that old. But... I really started to uh, 
spend more time with Jonas after I made Basquiat and after when we had that interaction with the film and then uh, whenever I could, uh, you know, he was always trying to get some money to keep the place going and you know, I'd give him things to sell or help in some kind of way. Or My daughter Lola was very, they were fond of each other and he was He was very free, and 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 I remember also at uh, he was really trying to save uh, the film for, uh, the uh, anthology film archives, and he wanted to save the building and he wanted to develop the building. And there was a guy who I got to say he would fix the building if he, but he wanted to put a couple of theaters in there. He wouldn't, he wouldn't compromise. And uh, I didn't know if that really was, but to him it was. And he also felt that um, uh, he didn't want the treasure of what he had to be dispersed at the Museum of Modern Art or in other kind of places where they didn't really, they, he, he was a very hands-on kind of guy. He was such a lovely, pure person. And also, he, uh, have you read any of his books? I mean, he had a, ex very simple and extraordinary ideas, you know, he talk about lawyers or people that um, would complain about their jobs or, or you do something, what kind of a job is it to have a job if you want to get off and do something else? What kind of a job would that be? But, uh, so I think the identity of the artist was a very, very important uh, philosophical stance that he, that he had. And I think that that kind of clarity was very attractive to a lot of other people. It's hard to talk about him in a way because there was just this sort of wave of kindness and of even the way that he would move around, it seemed like he was like a leaf that was being blown around uh, by the wind and it could go in any direction. And that's not saying that uh, he wasn't aware of that, but he ascribed to it, he embraced it and he discovered things in the practice of being like that. Did you see any of his films or like any of them? I'm just thinking about, uh, but then he had these video, he made all these videos and there was a moment where people, where he was having a show, where he was having the videos as works that you could buy, you could buy a video. But not just that where he could have you know, 10 television sets in there, but not all stacked like a Nam June Pike or whatever, but I'm talking about different works where you could buy a movie, essentially. I mean, I think if you think about it now with these non-refungibles or whatever, it might be a good thing to turn, you could probably do this, or help to turn one of, or you could talk to Vito about that. I mean. Jonas's things into something like that. Maybe finances uh, the film anthology archive uh, building. If it's not, I don't even know what you know where it's at right now. But I thought about that a bit recently because those images and the things that he has are so succinct and rare. He was there. I mean, when you ask me about, there's just so many, uh, he knew whether it was John Giorno or John Lennon, it was, he was uh, able to, but also uh, that whole thing, you know, I had nowhere to go. The feeling of somebody walking across Europe my father came here from Czechoslovakia when he was 15. 
16, 15. He was born in 1911 uh, in Slovakia, a place called Jasina. And he, uh, so he went to, his uncle Charlie thought he was well-dressed and smart. His father died when he was eight years old, but he couldn't get him a passport and he couldn't come to the United States right away, so he went to Belgium. Uh, he worked in a bakery, and one day a guy came in, and he says, you, you, you want to carry, it was Erev Shabbos, you want to carry my bread home? What's your name? He says, my name is Schnabel. He says, well, my name is Schnabel, too, and he left the bakery and stayed with this guy for three years, and then he came as a stowaway. Basically, he gave his watch. When he got to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, he said he was going to get a paper for somebody, and I think he met his Uncle Charlie at Dubrow's. But the sense of being European, the sense of being, um, finding something or this freedom in America and having witnessed things that I, we don't really know about, I think was something that uh, soulfulness that Jonas uh, had. He, he seemed to be always a refugee. But... Um, there's a song, a Leonard Cohen song, where he says, but when we come to love, we have to come as a refugee. And I think he uh, was palpable. Right now, the tentative title of the film is Fragments of Paradise. And it, it is a thing that I find so fascinating about him is he, it seems like he had this connection to, like, it's suffering, but if we can, find that beauty if we can capture it. And that is also what art is. You know, that's what makes life worth living. There's beauty in the mundane. He found peace. He, he made peace with it. The funny thing is, you know, when we showed At Eternity's Gate, he was very sick. I mean, he was dying. And we showed it at the New York Film Festival. And I knew that he was going to come. And there he was, 96, sitting in the middle of the auditorium. But he didn't get there right away. And before the movie, so I said, excuse me, I just have to say, hi, Jonas. It's great to see you here. We couldn't start the film without you. And he was very, very sick, but he never complained. It was amazing. I mean, he was a... So, you know, when you make paintings, I mean, we make, th you know, we make things. We make things and everything else doesn't exist, really. I mean, there's a painting in my bedroom from 1979, and I just look at this thing. I see the edge of where the painting is, and whoever's not in the painting is basically irreal. The painting will stay there. Uh, and you have to put everything into that thing so it'll be sound in its own nature eternally. It will bring other people into its present. Uh, the difference between art and life is that art is a representation of life. Life contains death. Art being a representation of life doesn't contain death, so ultimately it is optimistic, whether the subject matter is tragic or not. I mean, this is something from Tarkovsky, you know, where he, from Instant Light, where he says, so there can never be uh, pessimistic or optimistic, it's all optimistic, there can only be talent and mediocrity. And I used to struggle with the idea of, I knew Bob Hoskins, the actor, and I said, you know, it must be really um, difficult to be an actor and you're living your life, you do something in a particular performance and all of a sudden people treat you differently. A painter can look at the painting they made or whatever, they can go back and they can find the stability in that. And he said to me, well, I don't think that's right. He said, I think that moment when you do that thing, whether you're acting that part, you're painting that stroke, you're breathing that 
pause. Paraphrasing now. It's the same. And so in describing Jonas's body of work, I think it's so ethereal. And he's kind of like, there's a word called duende, a Garcia Lorca word. It means um, magic person or uh, when they like, uh, Jiminy Cricket was the duende of Pinocchio. But he was like that. There was something that, you know, because we make things that are physical things or we leave things, but there's something about him that was as light as something that's almost inexpressible. And that's an extraordinary thing to touch on and to find in people, a humanity that he would find in people uh, that he could record. But it would be, as soon as it was there, it was passing in a way. So I was always, it was hard for him to finance things that he wanted to do because what he made was out in the air somehow. But that being said, I think people that did make things gave him things or tried to support him because that inex thing of the inexpressible that he captured was so valuable, meaningful. Both you and Jonas share this quality of, of this fearless quality, like you're not plagued by insecurity. There's not like, oh, what does the audience want? What are they going to think of it? I, I mean, am I wrong or is, is there something? It, it's something else and I, I'm like wondering what that is. Oh, thank you for saying that. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, it's great to be unemployable. <laughs> uh, it's very difficult to work for other people. I, I mean, people that do, I, I commend them. I mean, it's amazing that people can do it. But I couldn't. I mean, I have worked at different jobs or whatever uh, in my life, but. Uh, I'm still uh, surprised when I don't have to go cook somewhere or do something, or that I, we live in a house. Uh, but work, I work all the time, and it's my pleasure to do it. And I definitely don't do it thinking, oh, is somebody going to like this painting? Is this going to please someone else? It's a nice quality if my wife looks at the painting and she says, ah, that is good. Because um, I think that she can see. But I think that when you're young, you look for agreement. You know, you look for agreement in a community, whatever. I think if you live long enough, you forget about, about that and you just, uh, the more you do whatever you're doing, the further it takes you into something that you never thought you'd see. Um, Diane Arbor said, uh, it's never like they said it would be. It's always what I've never seen before that I recognize. And um, so for me, I, I mean, I think Jonas felt like he was, he was interested. He was still discovering things all the time. And, and, um, and I, I feel that way. I don't feel like I need to copy myself in order to, and I don't need to make something to sell it. I never made anything to sell it. People could take that as arrogance. If you don't care or you're not trying to be part of, it's a real privilege to be able to do that. And, and, and But I kind of wouldn't know how to do it a different way. Or maybe you could rub some people the wrong way or whatever, but uh, you know, there's a great uh, line in, uh, in, and I love Dennis Hopper. He was a very good friend of mine. There's a great line in uh, Easy Rider where Jack Nicholson, you could see that scene. Maybe it'd be a good place to just cut to that where he's saying, uh, you know, people talk about freedom, but uh, when they see a free individual, it scares them. But I mean, it's, I'm, I'm butchering this line right there, but... Um, If you think of what happened in this country over the past year, or what's been brewing till we ended up with this, 
guy who's not even worth mentioning as the president. I mean, it, that particular moment in Easy Rider says everything. And uh, but when they see a free individual, it scares them. And uh, he was free. He, some, somewhere along the line, he was free. And it's and and the way his uh, the language, he, he, the way he could talk about things was uh, he could always go back to it and pick something up. Jonas didn't have this perfect, like he didn't feel like he had to overthink or become a perfectionist about something. He would just be so clear about like this is done and it's good, even if somebody else said, oh, well, that's a home video. He was in the present. He knew how to be in the present. I think that's what we're talking about. He really, uh, I think I think he's probably more fearless than I am. I mean, I, he wasn't, I don't think he was scared to die at all. And uh, he took it well. Anyway, you should read this book, Till, because he seemed to just beyond, be beyond gravity and the judgment of others because he'd already been somewhere and something happened to him. You don't exactly know what because it's never over-described in Daniel Kelman's book. Um, there's this incredible diary entry from Jonas from like 2006 where you go to his loft and you were looking at some of the archive and he was showing you some of the Fluxus works and you guys got into this argument about whether or not the avant-garde exists. I mean, do you remember, do you remember that? There are different permutations of avant-garde. I mean, if you think of Asger Jorn and people working or thinking about going back to the Dadas, I mean, you have different kind of uh, enclaves of this sort of thing. Uh, then you go to, um, you think about Paul Sharetz or people making movies like that. But on the other hand, you've got somebody like Vito Acconci who... Um, is or is using other kind of elements to get at this poetic. Um, it's so um, it's so it can be so generic in a way because the idea that um, materialism is something that's a bourgeois or and anti-materialist kind of thing, something that is, uh, doesn't fit into a house, doesn't fit into some kind of uh, structure that is uh, containable, seems to be that. But I think it's the gesture, no matter what form it takes. Uh, let's go back, let's think about, say, Clifford Still, looks at a painting. He thinks that portrait painting, uh, the paintings that, say, Goya made or whatever, of uh, that the portraits, because they're to please uh, an audience or to please the city, they're basically just uh, illustrating some kind of narcissistic or placating something in society. Even though he painted figurative paintings when he started out, um, on, on, he abandoned that at a moment, and he felt like, in order to be free, he had to get rid of things and invent a new kind of language. That being said, okay, so then he finds his irreducible language, which looks sort of like uh, ravines or 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 peaks, mountain peaks, the uh, Grand Canyon, but it's paint sitting on a ground, uh, unnameable. But somebody could look at that and say, okay, I mean, and Clifford still, I mean, he was so angry at Alfonso Osorio because he lent a painting to some show that he didn't want to be in that he went to his house and cut a hole in the painting. But someone could think that Clifford Still's paintings were not avant-garde because they, they're, it's painting and that, and, that, and, and what, and it's, it's, it's such a, uh, 
artic archetypal compromise of some sort, decorative practice. In fact, I saw somebody talking about, uh, I think there was a documentary about Kenny Scharf and some guy was talking about abstract painting as uh, decoration, like it was wallpaper. I mean, I was, it was amazing to hear, he wasn't saying that, but there was some guy named William something or other, oh wait. I, I mean, it was astoundingly stupid. Um, but I think that things that are avant-garde avant just means before sight, before you can see something else. You might be involved in a practice that might be very old, but you're doing something with it that is something that people don't understand. I mean, if you look at the 20th century art and you think of the trajectory of modernism and you think of Picasso and what was the uh, central, centrist, let's say, uh, notion of modernism going from figuration to abstraction and as if there was some kind of a, um, well, you had people like Francis Picabia and, uh, and artists that didn't quite fit into that canon and ultimately get Man Ray. I don't know, there's Duchamp, people saw him as a anti-painting uh, force. Not true. He actually made works that I think uh, if you think of the um, stoppages, he made works that were really a, a key for painting also. So you end up with, you look fast forward into the 20th, 20th, late 20th century, early 21st century, and if you look at, say, Sigmar Polka's work, um, you see, or Blinky Palermo, you see, uh, or my work, I mean, you see a different kind of, of uh, emphasis on what you think is possible as art. And you can look at, say, something that looks like, say, Helen Frankenthal or uh, uh, stain paintings. And they might have a similar appearance to Sigmar Polka's paintings that might be where he's using materials that might be bleeding into it, but they're radically different philosophically, uh, physically. I mean, they just mean totally different things. And so the avant-garde, that's a long-winded answer to your question, is, is, has to do with the unseeable. I mean, I had, I, I reached out and rewatched At Eternity's Gate, and it reminded me, something about it reminded me deeply of Jonas, and I think that there's like the, the subjectivity, a little bit about like how he always documented the world, but he was doing it in this poetic way. Um, I don't know, and just being on this edge where you can't really understand what, you, what it is you're looking at. It's the idiosyncratic nature of the camera, of the materials, of the, 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 the tenuousness of the day, the accidents that happen, different people's personalities, being open to change. All of that stuff comes into it, and it, isn't it interesting when somebody could actually claim that as their style. It's an accomplishment. I mean, it's also invisible, anyway. Um, it's funny because I wrote this script about 18 years ago about perfume by Patrick Susskin that was never used. The guy bought it and buried it. And I might still make it into, whether it be a movie or a six part uh, series. Uh, I rewrote it with my wife, her name's Louise Kugelberg, and uh, Daniel Kelman over the, during the pandemic. But Grenouille, I never saw it about being about a serial killer. I just, I just looked at him as a, he was an artist. But he couldn't share his contribution with anybody because when they saw it, or when they, when they smelled it, they were under its influence. They couldn't tell what was happening because that's how it functioned. And in a sense, I think that uh, it's good that you're doing this because it's nuanced that Jonas, uh, there, there, there's something, there's, an un, there's, a, there's really an unknown, you're talking about kind of a, an unknown genius, really, 
who people know in this community, but uh, it's a real plethora of stuff that people can use. And I guess also in, in, in my films, I don't really have hierarchical notions of, uh, I never went to film school. I never had a camera, actually, either, before I started to make a movie. I thought that was for somebody else. I made paintings, people, other people can use a camera. But I also looked at movie making as, uh, when I shot Basquiat, I just shot 90,000 square feet, I mean, 90,000 running feet, which is not very much, and treated it like a found object. I, that's what I had. I figured I'd turn it into something like that. It is what it became. It became what it is. <laughs> but anyway, um, so I'm not, and one of the reasons why I wanted to make The Diving Bell and the Butterfly was if the main character can't move, you could, it doesn't mean that your DP is blind and he's cutting the heads off of the people in the frame. It's a different way that you can frame your story and, and, and show things that maybe people didn't see before or that I wanted to see. So, um, it's funny because I, I, I wanted to show, at the, we're going to show at the basket at the Museum of Modern Art in the garden on the, on the, uh, it's the 25th anniversary, so on the, I think it's the 17th of June, if you want to come. And we were making it into black and white. It's really interesting, to, interesting is an innocuous word, but really far out to see how the language and whatever, when it's black and white, it's more like a Shirley Clark film or something. There was a, a wonderful guy named Peter Doyle, who's a colorist, and we were, uh, oh, and so the next day, I have the finished version of the film from, from 25 years ago, but also, and we did a black and white version, but the next day we, we were together from, well, why don't we make an experimental version? So. When I came back to uh, to Technicolor, Clark said to me, so uh, you're gonna experiment today. And I said to him, we experiment every day, which really we do. I mean, uh, even in making a plate painting of somebody or, or uh, I was painting a portrait the other day, I definitely, the reason I keep doing it is because I don't have a system for it. And I was painting a young woman the other day and I was thinking, I'm surprised as hell when it looks like anybody. But uh, it, uh, if you just keep leaning towards the divine light, it might hit you. At the end of the Trinity's Gate, you say, Defoe says something like, I will butcher it. I used to think an artist. What did, what did, what did he say? I used to think it was an artist's job right. to teach people how to see, and now I'm thinking about, is it eternity, or, I mean, is that, is that reflective of where your mind is at? I loved writing that. I used to think that it was an artist's job to show people how to see, but I don't feel that way anymore. I just think about my relationship to eternity. Yeah, I think when you're young, you're trying to tell somebody else something, or you're looking for agreement as you, maybe not everybody, but it was my light maybe and then later the more you do you you just and I think that's what you want to tell a young artist or whatever just do it because you want to do it the, pra the, the that's that's the thing doing it whether you're making a film or you're making a painting that's the reward to be engaged acting so, you know if you'd ask Willem he'd say yeah I want to be awake <laughs>